Well, good afternoon. As I think many of you know, when you have uh, visits and talks from important people, there's always somebody up here with a tie who says, welcome to Northeastern University. So today it's my privilege to do that. I'm Mel Bernstein. I'm the Senior Vice Provost for Research and Graduate Education here at the university. And it really is a great pleasure to welcome Ken Stewart back. Uh, for those of you who wonder what happens to people who get undergraduate degrees in biology at Northeastern, you're going to hear from one in a few minutes. Someone who's had quite a remarkable and illustrious career, uh, both in academia and then has gone off and established a, a standalone research institute in, in Seattle. There appears to be something either in the water in Seattle that encourages that to happen, or perhaps it's the caffeine from Starbucks that does it. But certainly Ken's interests in, de in vaccine development and studying uh, difficult diseases like HIV and others, along with his colleagues, has really been some, something quite remarkable as part of his career. And now he's uh, having joined with us as one of our partners as we moved out to Seattle. It really now gives us an opportunity be able to blend the best of the West and the East. So please welcome me, welcome Ken Stewart to uh, the university again. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be back. <laughs> and uh, so I'll try to give you, uh, this will be a little different talk for me because I'm gonna try to give you a bit of an overview but also get into some of the details so that some of the people who are not uh, detailed molecular biologists will have something from this, I hope, and others who are detailed molecular biologists will have something. So something for everyone or nothing for anyone. We'll see how that, uh, how that works out. Uh, it's actually, uh, in May, it'll be 50 years since I graduated from uh, Northeastern <coughs> University, so pretty, pretty, I don't know what happened at the time. But, but, Pretty eventful. I'll tell you a little bit what's happened at the time. So uh, I'll give you a, a brief history here. So uh, as you can see, a little hard to see from this stamps. No, I'll just do it with the Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so as you can see, I started at Northeastern, got my bachelor's degree, didn't know what I wanted to do. Took a master's at Wesleyan University where I went into a laboratory, started doing research, and knew exactly what I wanted to do. I found that I was working on the wrong organism. It was not a pathogen, but it was a protozoan parasite. And I'll show you a picture of the organism, a little video of the organism. And what happened is the biological complexity that I learned at Northeastern uh, all came together when I was able to see through a phase contrast microscope the internal complexity of this uh, organism. I see not in head. It was the wrong organism because it was not a disease agent, and I'd done a lot of reading in dusty libraries late at night, and found out the organism I really wanted to study was uh, Trypanosoma brucei, the cause of African sleeping sickness. I looked around to do a PhD, much to my dismay, there was no one in the country working on African trypanosomes at the time. I found that a former student of my uh, master's mentor, uh, would accept me in his lab under the condition that uh, I wouldn't expect him to teach me anything. I found this perfectly acceptable. So I went to the University of Iowa, did a PhD. It was actually great training because I had to figure out everything on my own. Maybe during the reception you can hear some horror stories of how to get infected mice through customs. <laughs> it was easier in those days and then uh, after I got my PhD, I did uh, two postdocs, one at the National Institute for Medical Research at Mill Hill in London, which was a fantastic experience. It was during the Beatles era. Some of you younger people in the audience may not remember the Beatles, but I, when there were the Beatles. After that, I did a second postdoc at Stony Brook, uh, which was also a great experience. Uh, and then I took a faculty position at the University of South Florida in Tampa. I found out I wasn't at that stage uh, that happy with an academic position, and I wasn't that happy in Florida. Uh, I had received a grant, and I decided 
I'm not sure how I decided, but I, I've always been a little bit independent that I would use that grant to create a not-for-profit research institute to focus on uh, global, but now called global infectious diseases, called tropical diseases at that time. Basically, to use the money that I was getting from NIH to do what I thought I wanted to do and what I thought was important. So uh, I had never been to Seattle. I contacted somebody who had applied for a job in Florida, actually, and flew out to Seattle. And just to make a long story short, uh, started a 501c3 not-for-profit resource organization with fantastic help from NIH, uh, who transferred my grant from, which was granted to the University of South Florida, transferred it to this new 501c3 in one day by hand carrying the application through the NIH bureaucracy. I loaded up a trailer, literally, with what little bit of lab equipment I had and personal belonging and drove from Tampa to Seattle and rented space and that's how it began. So that was in 1976, <coughs> three years later, here's the entire institute. We were in a shopping mall yeah, just outside of Seattle. Uh, there's actually, uh, with three investigators there at the time, the person on my, this, your, uh, your right is Steve Reeves. He's since started a biotech company, Carixa, and then is now at the Infectious Disease Research Institute. He was a postdoc in my lab, and then started his own lab. Uh, there's another person who's not there, and I'm there, second from the left and in my Hawaiian shirt, and then in that picture, the three people standing next to Steve Reed are members of our board of trustees who also washed the glassware, we used glassware at that time. Uh, the two people sitting on the ground on the left are our, our, our administration, so the administrator and the finance person. Uh, there's a couple of technicians and a couple of volunteers on the ground, and then the other people, there's two tech, three technicians standing and a few postdocs. That was the entire institute in 1976. So to fast forward a little bit, we uh, moved to Seattle and grew a little bit, and then we raised a little bit of money and we built this building. So this is a bit over 100,000 square foot building, state-of-the-art laboratories, it's got more concrete in it and steel in it per square foot than I think any other building in Seattle, actually. And it's designed to be vibration and uh, uh, proof. Uh, we have now a uh, bit under 400 uh, personnel uh, at the institute, and our project's about 55 million a year. It goes up and down a little bit this year. It's moved down. I think it's happened to a lot of people. So, right from the beginning, although probably not as well stated, this is what the goals of the institute were. And as Joseph Aoun mentioned to me this morning and reminded me, I did call it the biomedical research institute, not an infectious disease research institute, because the idea is to really understand fundamental cell and molecular biology at the same time trying to combat diseases. So as you can read here, what we wanted to do is understand what we could about how these infectious diseases work, how they function, how they cause the diseases, and the reason for this is we wanted to develop both biological understanding but also interventions to either prevent the disease, the suffering, and the death from the disease. And that's uh, basically been the mission of the Institute uh, ever since. We've got, we underwent a little bit of branding, tried to get rid of Seattle out of the name, uh, decided not to. And so our shorthand name is Seattle Biomed, but the full name is Seattle Biomedical Research Institute. So the areas that we work on are in viral diseases. We have a program at HIV, a smaller program in dengue and uh, influenza. Uh, HIV is focused on, they're all focused on uh, understanding vaccine development and immune responses to these diseases, to these infections, and also to immunization. Bacterial diseases that primarily focused on uh, TB, we had to build a huge BSL-3 facility, it was very expensive. Uh, but we also have a, an emerging biodefense program which is really focused on protein structure biology. And then the protozoal disease is uh, malaria, toxoplasm, which is related to malaria, and trypanosomatids, and I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, malaria and the trypanosomes uh, a little bit later on. And then, as I said, one of the goals is to understand uh, fundamental aspects of cell biology, molecular biology, etc. So here are the pathogens. I'll step out here. Can you hear me? 
So uh, that's the HIV uh, virus, what do you know? Influenza, dengue virus, TB bacteria. This is malaria, and that's a malaria parasite that's first in the red blood cell. And these are the uh, trypanosomes. And what you're looking at is is about all that was known about trypanosomes in this study. And it's been astounding to me what has been learned in the, uh, since I started working on trypanosomes. It's really been uh, dramatic advances. Not that it's led to many interventions yet, but I project in fairly short order uh, it will. So right from the beginning, we wanted to take an integrated approach to the, this research. Uh, and right from the beginning, we wanted to centralize and share to the extent possible all the expertise and all the facilities and capabilities. And that was the rationale for Research Institute as opposed to moving to a university where at the time, the, uh, the, the, what happened is you'd have a faculty member with various numbers of people in their lab and they had their own project. They interacted to some degree with others, uh, but pretty much worked uh, as an independent entity. The concept of the Institute, right from the beginning, was to have a much more integrated approach uh, to research. And this is sort of an updated view of this with kind of a little graphic with puzzle pieces. But there's four major components. You can slice this pie in a variety of ways, but we have a lot of expertise that's uh, focused on understanding the biology of the pathogens, both these uh, protozoa, bacteria, and viruses, or all three. Uh, in addition, we have a lot of expertise, technical expertise, as listed in the lower right. I can read them faster than I can say them. Uh, we have a lot of technology, which are uh, in technological cores, uh, many of these. And what we don't have, we access through partnerships, such as chemistry, for example. And then we have a lot of uh, technical facilities that we need. Viveria for uh, mouse animal models and sectaries. We actually have malaria infected mosquitoes in the Institute. I'll show you a picture of that facility. There's a little bit of uh, containment needed for that. BSL-3, especially for TB. You have to wear respirators because it's an air uh, transmitted. Uh, we have a clinical trial center, which is uh, used primarily for a malaria vaccine uh, testament, testing, and then a variety of technology cores, which are uh, run by uh, well-trained uh, people who run the cores, and this provides access to everybody at the Institute to as much technology as we have in-house. I debated whether or not to show this slide. This is a slide showing some of the instruments, what I call beige boxes. Uh, you know, these are instruments usually costing a few hundred thousand dollars and cost even more to run over time. Uh, but they allow us to make the analytical measurements uh, that we need. So some of you are familiar with these and others are bored. So uh, one of the key assets that we have are the people at the Institute. And this is true of all institutions. We have incredibly motivated uh, people at the Institute, not only capable, but highly motivated, and that's actually how we selected them. We were visited by Melinda Gates, a neighbor of ours, and she did an interesting thing. She went and talked to a few people who were just, I shouldn't say just, who were technicians in the lab, and asked them what they did before they came to the Institute. And interestingly, one of them turned out to be a Renaissance scholar. Another person had been doing something else, I can't remember what now, and another person had undergone fairly conventional scientific training. But I can say to a person, uh, everybody at the Institute is really bonded with the mission. Uh, and that's really critical, including our board of trustees. So I want to focus, give you two examples today of the types of things that we're doing to illustrate how we approach things. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, trypanosomes. And uh, the goal there is to develop drugs uh, for these diseases, and I'll explain that. And then malaria, where the goal is to develop vaccines uh, to prevent or infection. These organisms have a few things in common. They are complex organisms. That means they have eukaryotic cells like our cells with nuclei, organelles, and uh, water genes. And uh, they're all transmitted, incidentally, by insects, which I'll show you. Well, I won't show you a mosquito, but the malaria is transmitted by a mosquito. They're highly adapted to the host which means that you co-evolve the host, which 
creates complications when you're trying to elim eliminate them, although it means they don't kill you as quickly also. And then uh, they primarily afflict the poor. So that means that the large pharmaceutical companies uh, have not as much interest in these as, uh, say, chronic diseases where there's a, a larger market. Uh, wars in developing <coughs> countries almost invariably result in increased incidence of these diseases. And then the biology of these organisms is really exciting and has actually informed a lot of biology that extends well beyond uh, these organisms. And so a lot of times when people ask me, well, why, why do you work with these organisms? And one of the reasons I work with them is because the inherent beauty of the complexity of these organisms is just astounding. As you learn more and more, you find there's many, many, many more layers of complexity of these organisms. And it's all interesting. It's all interesting. And then, in addition, these are disease agents, and certainly we want to prevent these uh, diseases. So let me give you a uh, minimal background of trypanosomes. I'm going to talk primarily about one. Uh, there are three related pathogens. Uh, they're cl quite closely related, even though they separated from each other evolutionarily about 500 million years ago, so fairly recently. And uh, the first one, uh, but they cause very distinct diseases. So there's a parasite, uh, Trypanosoma brucei and its relatives, that cause African sleeping sickness. Sounds like a pretty innocuous disease. However, it's a terrible disease. It's invariably fatal, if not treated. The treatments are terrible, okay? In fact, 7% of the people die from treatment. 50% 50, 50 have brain damage from second stage. Uh, human African trypanosomiasis, 50% survive okay, but if you're not treated, you're dead. Uh, so sleeping sickness, you have is human African trypanosomiasis. There's no good name for the disease, that's true. Uh, the second one is Chagas disease. It's also a trypanosome that's uh, closely related. It's named after Evander Chagas, who described the parasite. And then Leishmaniasis is actually a, a diverse set of diseases, also named after somebody, Leishman, who was a German who first observed the parasite of people who had the diseases. Uh, a couple of key differences, which I won't go into detail, but just for your information. The African sleeping sickness parasite uh, lives in the blood, outside of cells, and the way it avoids the host is it keeps changing the surface, its surface composition. So to make antibodies against it, kill most of the parasites, and they change some of them. If you change the surface, they're not affected by the antibodies. So that's antigenic variation is a form of immune evasion. Chagas disease, so if it's, and it's an acute disease, although definition of acute is a little uh, flexible because some, sometimes the disease lasts a couple of years. Uh, Chagas disease and Leishmaniasis, those parasites go into cells, so they are intracellular. Chagas disease is mostly muscle cells that they end up uh, staying in. And Leishmaniasis, they stay in white blood cells in the macrophage. Call them the Rambo of parasites because they actually reside in and take over the very cell that's supposed to kill them. Uh, both of these, the latter two are chronic diseases, they probably are potentially lifelong, and they're very debilitating, and they are typically fatal if, if untreated, or they can be fatal. Uh, there's about a million people, round numbers, uh, that die from these three diseases together. Uh, many more are debilitated, especially from Chagas disease. Uh, the drugs, there are drugs available, they're inadequate, but very toxic. There's no vaccine, there probably will be no vaccines. Perhaps it could be a vaccine for at least some subspecies of leishmania, but it's very unlikely because these are so well adapted and the diagnostics are not very good. So not a very pretty picture of the situation. And it really hasn't changed that much uh, <coughs> since uh, I started investigating these. It illustrative of the fact that there's not been that much investment. So uh, here's some examples of pathogenesis. I'll spare you the gory slides. So the two top slides are of African sleeping sickness. Both of those women died. Innocuous, right? Sounds innocuous. Uh, the treatment is terrible. Uh, what's being shown in the, in the lower left is an infusion uh, with a drug called uh, the flunathine. 
uh, you need a huge quantity of this because the drug is uh, urinated out uh, rapidly. Uh, that's one of the two treatments. The other treatment is the one that's lethal, so uh, frequently. Leishmaniasis uh, it has several forms. I've just shown you the easiest one to tolerate, which is cutaneous leishmaniasis. You see that that's huge also on the back of someone's hands. But uh, it's devastating uh, this, how these ulcers can happen. In fact, there's forms of the disease that erode the facial mucosa and uh, other terrible forms of the disease, so it's a very bad disease. And then there's another form that gets into the uh, viscera and uh, is lethal, especially if it's common to children in the Mediterranean. And then Chagas disease is very debilitating. It affects uh, the heart, causes hypertrophy of the ventricles and thinning of the ventricular walls. Uh, people generally uh, they don't even know they get uh, the disease after maybe a decade or two. They start noticing that they're short of breath. They have a uh, doctor find out that they've got a large heart. They need pacemakers, and uh, ultimately their heart can rupture. They can have sudden death. So. Uh, this is the leading cause of heart disease in Central and South America. And also it's now invading Texas, perhaps in part to global warming. So here's the distribution of these diseases. Chagas disease in the upper left is in Central and South America, a little bit in Texas, appropriately. And uh, also African trypanosomiasis, as you might uh, suspect, is in Sub-Saharan Africa. The darker red indicates where there's a higher incidence. And Leishmaniasis is widespread throughout the tropics and subtropics. So here's what the bugs look like. Uh, they're stained to show the nuclei. You can see a little bit of the cells. Uh, Leishmaniasis, they're inside a macrophage. They're just spherical little cells. You can see there's a bunch of them inside the macrophages. Uh, and uh, then there's the African trypanosome and then trypanosoma cruzi, which causes Chagas disease. And those two organisms look alike. Uh, and they have more similar genomes. And sand flies, and that sand fly is tiny, by the way. I have some sitting in a vial on my shelf there. You wouldn't notice them. You wouldn't notice them biting you. Tetsi fly, you would notice, it's about the size of a horse fly, very aggressive. And the reduvid bug looks like a cockroach, but they feed at night, so, and the feeding is painful, so a lot of people who get infected from the reduvid bug don't know they get infected until they wake up and they have a swelling, typically around the eye. So those are the parasites, those are the organisms that um, transmit them. Now, just to give you a little bit more feeling for the internal detail, uh, here's a couple of uh, false color uh, electron micrographs showing a little bit of the subtleties of the external structure, but I think What's more interesting is the internal structure. You can see there's a lot of complex internal structure of trypanosome in the upper right, and then Leishmania in the lower lower left. They have these little uh, tails, these little flagella that sometimes run along the uh, length of the cell. So you can see in the African trypanosome, T. brucei, you can see there's a flagellum that's running across the cell. It's actually attached to the cell, and it's a motile uh, organelle. So. This is similar to the image that I had when I graduated from Northeastern. I went to Wesleyan and I got a face contrast microscope. It wasn't a trypanosome I looked at, but it was a related organism. And I'm going to show you a little video. And uh, what I want you to pay attention to is you can see there's some little dots inside these cells. And these are complex organelles made up of uh, probably, in the case of the mitochondria, about 1,200 proteins. And then there's a bunch of other little spherical bodies that are contain different proteins, do different things. So these are the inner workings of the cell. This is what attracted me to work on these organisms. And I realized that all this complexity, DNA replication, metabolism, all of everything that I'd ever learned about it at Northeastern was actually happening in something magnified 2,000 times you couldn't see unless you had a phase contrast microscope. So I'll probably run through this a couple of times and so maybe I'll pause it. Uh, Breathe. So they tend to swim. What you think is the front is actually the back. <laughs> just the way they are. I'll do that again and I'll, I'll pause it so you can just get a little bit of feel for the organelles. You can just see the organelles inside. And the other thing you can get a feel for is that unlike the electron micrograph, these organelles are dynamic. They're actually moving around a lot. 
and there's a lot of molecular dynamism that's happening. Uh, the proteins are interacting and interacting with each other and then separating and then they're being modified and then there's molecules going in and out. So uh, that's part of the new approach that people are thinking about, which is called systems biology. Trying to understand the interaction of all these molecules and how they're functioning and then how that leads ultimately either to disease or in some cases uh, to response to a drug or in the case of the human uh, system, the human immune system, how that could lead to a, uh, an immune, protective immune response or a vaccine. So these are all of the drugs that are currently approved for use for these three pathogens. For, uh, and none of them are ideal. Let's just leave it at that. So there's a dramatic need for drugs. And some of these you'd, would not be approved as drugs today. I think they could never get through the approval process. Maybe, maybe one that could get through. Uh, they're all uh, incredibly toxic. They were, some of them were developed 50 more years ago, actually more than that, uh, through the German dye industry. Okay, that tells you it's way back. Okay, so how do we approach uh, discovering drugs uh, for this? Okay, so first of all, we want to understand how the organism works understand the fundamental biology, validate the drug targets, and our approach is to use genetic validation and computation. Try to identify what are we going to try to find compounds that uh, inhibit the function of some of these proteins, these drug targets. Identify and design and test drugs, so this is what we know as Mike Polastri. Uh, he'll do the design, we'll co-identify, I don't know. And we'll do the testing. And that's that. A few words, a lot of work. Uh, very, very interesting, exciting. Takes a lot of uh, understanding. And then we want to apply the systems approach to really understand what's going on and simultaneously learn which drugs look more promising. What are they doing to the cell, and what's that telling us about the biology of these cells or biology of any organism? And then to actually get these drugs to get to people, we need to work with consortia that can move it through the drug development pipeline, which is a very complex process, in which is, these are just early steps in that process. So uh, this is a diagram of the genomes. We sequence the genomes of these three organisms as part of a consortium that we put together. And so uh, what you'll see here are three sets of, these organisms have two pairs of chromosomes like us. So this is just showing one of each of the chromosomes of each of the three organisms, and we're aligning the chromosomes that are basically have the same genetic information with each other from each of the three different organisms. And there's a different number of chromosomes in each of the pathogens. So in some cases, you'll see more than one chromosome. But in each case, the middle chromosome here is the chromosome of groups of The chromosomes, and there's numerous chromosomes above, but there's more smaller chromosomes in the chain and then in the bottom is the genome of the chromosome cruise act. And it's not that they have smaller chromosomes, but it, can, it illustrates a difference between the genomes of these organisms. So these lines connecting these pathogens identify the genes that are highly similar between these organisms. In the first instance, there's a couple of insights that I won't go into from this. It was pretty startling when we saw this arrangement of genes. But you can see that, for the most part, very large proportion of the genes, of the same genes or the corresponding genes are in the same order on the chromosomes between these organisms. So that shows the central similarity between these three pathogens, even though they diverged 500 million years ago. But there's differences that really relate to the differences in the disease and how these organisms evade the immune system. So these circles indicate genes that are only found in chromosomal these genes encode the proteins they put on the surface to evade the immune system, so antigenic variation. And then the trypanosome cruzi leads to actions where there's lots of repeated sequences. In fact, they're repeated so much that the computer couldn't tell how many copies there were. Uh, and these are surface proteins that the trypanosome cruzi puts on its surface, but we actually don't know the functions of those. But it's probably related to immune evasion, uh, either in the insect vector or in the when it's uh, infecting a, a blood cell. And then Leishmania has uh, some extra genes, and what it's probably doing is manipulating the function of the macrophage so that the macrophage cannot eliminate uh, the parasite. So it 
it's the route that it's taken is to been is has been to prune down its genome, but make certain genes that are not present in the others that can then control the uh, immune response. However, each of these have about 10,000 genes, so we have about 25,000 genes in humans. So these three organisms together, it's more genes than the human genome has. Uh, not much controlling information in between the genes. That's a big difference. Uh, and all of the drug targets are there. And if you can make a vaccine, all the vaccine candidates are there. It's a little difficult to tease out of the 10,000 genes per organism what's the right one to test it. So it's a, <coughs> excuse me, a pretty uh, daunting pro prospect. Did you put this down on the table and lurch on the crab, right? <coughs> so uh, I'll show you how we've tested whether these uh, genes are potentially uh, good drug targets. The way we do this is we had, uh, and others had prioritized, what are the most likely drug targets. <coughs> then genetically we removed the two genes, two copies of each gene that was identified as a prioritized drug target by genetic methods using the common DNA techniques. And then put in, not in that order, a gene, a copy of the gene that we could switch on and switch off using uh, an antibiotic tetracycline. So we could have cells, in fact the same cell, cell line, that in the presence of uh, tetracycline, the gene would be off, the only copy of the gene. And the absence of tetracycline, that gene would be on. And so as you can see here in that uh, top slide, uh, the parasites over a series of days just keep growing when the gene is on. When we shut the gene off, the cells die. In this particular case, this is a gene that has a role in protein biosynthesis. It brings, uh, adds, the right amino acid to a transfer RNA it goes to the ribosome makes protein. It's called isoleucyl tRNA synthase. So we do this in vitro uh, in tissue culture plates uh, with the stage, but the stage of the cell, uh, its life cycle, where it is actually causing disease. So this is the same stage of the parasite, which has a life cycle in the insect as well. Uh, that would be growing in the bloodstream of an infected person. However, we wanted to ask, well, is this true in mice? So what we do is we infect mice with this, and then we feed the mouse a uh, doxycycline, derivative of a tetracycline, and you can see in the mice that even though the parasites, we let we wait a day until we can see parasites have an effect of the mice, and then the parasites die. So we know that this drug works, this compound, I mean, this gene is essential not only when it's growing in culture, but also when it's growing in the mouse model system. We haven't been able to do this in humans yet, so we probably won't. <laughs> now, of course, what we're looking for is a drug. So we did some uh, relatively superficial uh, structural modeling, looked for compounds related to uh, an intermediate that's involved in adding amino acid to the transfer RNA. We identified about 50 compounds that we could get from NIH. We were able to get, I think, about 40 of those compounds and tested them. And I think about 20 of them actually inhibited the growth of the parasites. And then what I'm showing here is, I think, it's like seven or so of these compounds, which the identification on the comp of the compound is just the number that's on the right. And then what we do it is the further that uh, black diamond is to the left, means the lower the concentration of the, paras of the compound that's needed to kill half the parasites, the IT50 or EZ50. And uh, as you can see, there's a range. And then on the right is the concentration of the same compound that will have the same effect on mammalian cells, and actually 50 different kinds of mammalian cells. So the point of this is you can see that uh, you can use 10,000, almost 10,000 uh, times less of some compounds to kill the parasites than you need that then will even uh, affect the uh, mammalian cell. And so this was a selected set to show that there was selectivity, that we had found a uh, compound that would selectively kill parasites and not kill at least mammalian cells in culture. So uh, we went a bit further. So how do we know 
that when we're killing those parasites with these compounds, that it's actually killing them because of the uh, protein, the uh, tRNA synthetase that we had selected as a target, because we had tested that compound uh, so, uh, in, uh, in vitro or recombinant protein and showed how the uh, drug worked, that it actually inhibited the activity of that protein. Uh, we know how it inhibited it by uh, some enzymology. Uh, but then the question is, yeah, but what about in the cell? And so what we did is we, were we made some cells where we could have the cells make more of the protein uh, and under one condition than another. And so if you look at the bar graph in there, uh, where it says WT, which is for wild type, and then there's some other numbers there, you can see that tall black line is an indication using antibodies of how much uh, additional protein is made compared to that gray line, okay, that gray bar. So we know that that's overexpressed several fold. So they have uh, this cell line in the presence of uh, tetracycline has more, about three times as much protein as it cells normally do. And then, as indicated on the graph, you can see that there's, uh, with the open circles that it's shifted to the right. And that means you need more of the drug when you have more of the protein. So that's an indicator that the drug is probably acting, not necessarily exclusively, but largely acting against that um, protein. And we're measuring uh, cell growth. We're measuring the amount of you need to block the cell growth 50%. And then if we, instead of putting in a wild type, version of that protein, we put in a mutated version of the protein, it eliminates that shift. So we have good evidence actually that this compound is acting on that, uh, acting on that protein within the cells. So we then took this compound and we asked, well that's good enough, does it actually cure mice? And so in the top graph, what we do is we infect mice, we wait about a day, until there's about 1,000 parasites growing per ml of blood of the mouse. And then we give it different concentrations of this compound, which just has this long number. And you can see that what's happening is that as the concentration goes up from black to orange to blue, and then whatever the other colors are, you can see that the line is going, I'm colorblind, kind of the line is going down. Uh, and that means there's more inhibition that's associated with more drug. And so that's a good uh, dose response indicating that this drug actually will cure the parasites within mice. Uh, and then we do what's called the Kaplan-Meier curve. We just ask, well, do the mice actually survive? Because we don't know whether it's truly killing them. We know that it's knocking down their growth rate. Are they gone? And so what you can see, the arrow that's pointing at this line that's running flat along the cross, uh, across the top, that at uh, 50 milligrams per kilogram uh, of treatment, uh, those mice never die. So they are cured uh, of the parasites. At, at half that concentration, uh, the mice eventually recover, probably because the parasites go into the brain where there's less accessibility of this particular drug, and then they come out, or at least less accessibility at the concentration uh, that we're using. So the concentration in the brain may be less, or whatever other site uh, exists. So that's that tRNA synthetase. We also, another set of proteins that we looked at are protein kinases, and the reason for that is there's been a lot of drugs uh, directed at protein kinases. Protein kinases do the simple things. They add phosphates to proteins, and it has a dramatic effect and regulates the activity, controls the activity uh, of the proteins. And so we tested this, uh, about 180 protein kinases in African trypanosomes. We were able to test definitively 91 of these, or almost definitively, and show that out of those, we identified 20 that are essential. Again, by shutting off uh, the uh, gene. This is the graph is just an example of that. Uh, we show that 20 of them are essential, 37 are not essential, and the other 34 of those set that we tested are probably not essential. We just haven't fully completed those experiments yet. And then if you look at the picture of the cells on the lower left, especially the lower left of the four panels, you can see what look like some weird looking things, at least weird to us. And those are monster cells, and that's one day after, 24 hours after uh, we shut off the expression of the gene, and those cells are very sick, they're dying. 
Uh, then uh, on the lower right, uh, what we were able to do is we were able to put in a copy of the gene that we, of this gene, that had a fluorescent tag on it and ask where is that protein in the cell. <coughs> and it turns out that it's in little dots in the nucleus, which are called speckles. Uh, this is associated with the regulation of RNA processing or RNA splicing which is a mechanism of gene regulation. And it turns out, in collaboration with people at the University of California, San Francisco, when we treat with drugs that we know interact with this kinase, it disrupts this RNA process. So now we're able to use the drug, as well as these mutations, to understand the process of RNA processing uh, in these cells. So the next steps for drug development uh, is to utilize the consortium. We've created a lot of uh, consortium interactions, some more active than others, and this actually uh, together allows us not only to go through the early stages, the preclinical stages, but actually to the drug uh, through animal studies, ultimately through human studies by using uh, this consortium. You'll notice in the lower right we've added both these universities. All right, I'm going to shift gears quickly now. We're going to talk about something completely different, and that's malaria. Okay, each year there's somewhere between 300 and uh, 500 million cases of malaria each year, and hundreds of thousands of deaths, mostly in children under the age of five. There is no vaccine, there's one under test. Drug resistance and development diagnostics is not very good. So, big problem, it's a big problem. I just want to give you a little bit of background so you can understand what we're doing. You probably know malaria is transmitted by the bite of a mosquito. There are these little modal forms that I'll show you a video of that uh, after the mosquito deposits uh, these parasites, they go into the capillaries, get into the bloodstream, and then go to the liver. They infect the liver cells and they multiply so that each parasite makes about 50,000 parasites. But there's no disease at this stage uh, in the liver. The parasites then exit the liver, they infect red blood cells, and there's repeated rounds of multiplication. Uh, there's a lot of complexity that happens at this stage that I don't have time to go into, uh, but this is where there is disease, and actually there's several forms of the disease. And then the parasites start producing sexual stages that get picked up by the mosquitoes, and then complete their life cycle in the mosquito, they go infect somebody else. So this is what they look under the microscope, like under the microscope. This is under ideal conditions. If you ever looked at a smear of, stained smear of blood from someone that's infected with malaria, you wonder how people diagnose it. And I guess the answer to that is with low accuracy. Because I've looked, and it's really, really difficult unless a person has a very heavy infection. On the left is the early stage of development. There's basically one parasite cell in there. On the right, that cell is undergoing multiplication. They'll make up to as many as 16 parasites uh, per red blood cell. Kill burst the red blood cell and then go on and infect others. So it's, here's a little uh, higher uh, power image. The one in the upper left is the sporozoite. So that's the stage that's delivered by the mosquito. It's very important, sporozoite. Uh, after it comes out of the liver, if you look in the center of that upper right, you can see a little flask-shaped cell that's poked up against a red blood cell. So that's the liver stage, or actually the stage that also will burst out of infected red blood cell that's in the process there of infecting the red blood cell. And then in the lower left is the parasites a section, so it's a slice to an infected red blood cell, which is stained in a false color image, actually. And you can see that there's parasites multiply, multiplying in the red blood cell. And then on the lower right, you can see two red blood cells, one full of parasites that hasn't burst yet, and then one that has burst for a better quality image than I showed you uh, earlier. So what are the vaccine concepts? Can you develop a vaccine against these? And the answer is yes, absolutely yes. So the stage before the parasites complete their cycle in the liver is called the pre-erythrocytic stage, the stage from the time the mosquito bites before the parasites come out of the liver. If you use parasites which have been irradiated with x-rays, so they're alive, but they're disabled, and they can infect and get into the liver, uh, but they cannot get out of the liver, cannot reproduce. <coughs> if you give people enough of those parasites, they become immune, and you cannot infect them again, at least with the same strain of malaria parasite, and probably with other strains. So they have what's called sterile immunity. They are protected from infection. 
And so this is not due just to the whole organism, it's probably due to some components of the organism. And so the vision is to develop a vaccine after we identify what those components are that are responsible for that immunity, uh, and then formulate it in a way and figure out how to deliver it so that we can uh, mimic that type of immunity. The other approach is to immunize with whole organisms, uh, and currently we're doing both approaches uh, experimentally to understand the uh, immune response. In the blood stage, once they're in the blood stage, uh, there's a type of natural immunity that occurs, uh, but the parasites are not eliminated. They're present there almost all the time, actually. And there is immunity that prevents disease, but people who live in endemic areas probably all have parasites almost all the time in their circulation. And then in the mosquito stage, one could imagine a vaccine that blocks the transmission from the human into the mosquito, but it doesn't uh, protect the person who gets vaccinated, protects others. The focus that we have at the Institute is on the pre-erythrocytic vaccine, namely before they uh, get out of the liver stage. And that's, this is because it's a choke point. There's very few parasites at this stage that are delivered. There's proof of principle that's been done and then the idea is to compare the immune responses in detail of immune and non-immune uh, people, narrow down the candidates, and then work our way through the vaccine candidates. And then using the systems biology approach is to analyze a wide variety of uh, very large data sets to understand what are the immune responses, what are relevant to the disease, what are the perhaps the functional immune responses that are responsible for protection, uh, how you could then uh, improve a vaccine by changing its and improving its composition because you have a way to measure, it's getting better, and then also to get at other aspects of the biology. So here's another video. What I'm going to show you here is, this is actually a mouse here, so it's not humans, where there's an infected mosquito that's infected with parasites which are labeled with green fluorescent protein. So you're going to see sporozoites that are being delivered by a mosquito. And when a mosquito bites, it doesn't just stick a tube in, it sticks a raspy-like device in and it probes. And it tears the tissue and creates, a tissue, creates fluid, and then it deposits the parasites in there. Parasites are motile, they can move around by what's called gliding motility. Then they find their way into the capillaries, and then they go to the liver and infect themselves. But, uh, and then that's a picture of a sporozoic by electron microscope. That's just shows you what it looks like, but you saw the internal contents before, so it's complicated. So I'll run this little video, and then you can just see, here's the mosquito's mouth parts. It's going to probe in and out here, and then it'll probe a little bit further along. You can see there's already some sporozoites, these little uh, parasites that are here, uh, that have already been deposited, so you can just take a look at this. There's no music. So you can see the probing. You can see how there's some parasites that are being deposited here. And they're moving. There's the probing again. The probing again. So there's probably something like 100 parasites that are deposited. Not all of them get out of the skin. Not all of them invade the liver. But only one get into the liver for an infection. <coughs> so what we've done is you can attenuate these parasites by a few different methods. I told you you can radiate using uh, radiation, or you can use drugs, primaquinic, chloroquine, so you can stop the parasite. Or you can do what we did, which is to genetically attenuate the parasites by removing genes which are necessary to complete the liver stage of the life cycle. They can go through the rest of the life cycle, but they can't get out of the liver. And so we've made a, a number of mutations, which are listed here, which are called P52, P36, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't mean much, just an abbreviation, but what we've done is we removed genes. Now, malaria only has one set of chromosomes, they're half old. So we only have to do this once, so it's difficult. And then this is a diagram of what a, you know, the reddish brown is supposed to be liver cells. Normally, the cell would go through a, uh, this growth and replication and then release of these uh, forms called merozoites that infect their blood cells. These other mutations where we've had removed one or two genes get arrested at a certain stage. And so what we did is, oops, I didn't have to do that yet. Uh, sensitive. Uh, so we use this mutation here that stops them in the early stage. Okay. 
So these will infect, those should stop uh, early in the life cycle. We know that these genes have a role in bringing nutrients from the red blood cell into the parasite. We don't know all of them. So here's the room, here's uh, people doing a clinical trial. They're all dressed up in nice little white coats, and they're dissecting uh, mosquitoes to look at if they're infected or not infected, because this is part of a clinical trial where people have, in this case, I don't know if they're being immunized with their, uh, or being challenged, because we immunize them with three rounds of mosquito bites with these uh, genetically attenuated parasites. And then after three rounds, wait a month, have the last one, and then we give them wild type mosquitoes, which would normally infect them and see if they're immune or not and look at their immune responses. So this is what the challenge looks like. Again, as friends uh, looking at the demonstration. So the mosquitoes are in that ice cream cup, which has a net on the top and they bite people's arms. We uh, basically let people get a few mosquito bites and then uh, we have controls. People who have not been immunized, we know they always get infected, so we know that the mosquitoes work. And then we asked, in this case, so this was a trial, this was a trial, so we're early stage in this, where we looked at the responses. Now what happened is we had to stop this trial because these parasites are not completely attenuated. One out of the six volunteers got a blood stage infection. So we had to stop the uh, trial so we could never do the challenge to find out whether the others were protected. So unfortunate, but <coughs> that's the way it goes. But anyway, what we did see is that there were immune responses, okay? There were, on the top, there were cellular immune responses, which are responses to this major surface protein, which is called surface sporozoic surface protein, MCSP. Those little dots uh, indicate that those are white blood cells that are making immune responses in response to CSP. And then using a flow cytometer, looking at a certain subset of the cells, as indicated by the circles, I know it's not that obvious, there's uh, in response to CSP, these cells are also getting activated and uh, showing that they are immune responsive to this uh, protein. So the human immune cells have been educated to recognize the uh, presence of these uh, parasite proteins. And these would be the types of responses they would expect from a protective uh, response. There's also antibodies produced, and you can <coughs> see, um, as indicated by that red uh, oval here, that there's antibodies after the second round of immunization, we're unable to do the third, or have cells from the third in this case, or antibodies from the third. There's antibodies produced that are specific for this liver stage protein, the CSP protein, but there's no antibodies produced to this major surface protein of blood stage parasites. So we know we've restricted the immune response to the liver stage. We don't know if it's completely. And then we uh, use the microarray which had dots of uh, 2,300 proteins out of the 5,300 proteins to ask you know, whether there's antibodies against any of these proteins. And on the uh, upper right here is the array, which is just tested with antibody for which there's no, somebody that's not been exposed to uh, malaria. And on the bottom is uh, antibodies of antiserum from a child in Mali. And you can see all those dots that are lighting up indicating immune responses to some of the parasite proteins. But when we uh, check uh, with the raw data here after immunization, what we found is there's a smaller subset of proteins, uh, maybe about 30 proteins, most of which we don't know what they do. Uh, CSP is definitely one of them, but there's about 30 proteins that there's immune responses to, antibody responses to, uh, that are potentially new uh, candidates for a vaccine. And then, uh, so the question is, can we develop some assays and we find out whether, yeah, it can be a lot of antibodies, but are they doing anything? So we develop what we think as a functional assay to assess whether these antibodies do anything. So this is an assay that was developed to ask whether these antibodies would prevent sporozoites from getting into liver cells. And so what we do is we uh, infect liver cells. We look with a flow cytometer. Uh, so if you look at this SPZ is for sporozoites, if we incubate these cultured, these are hepatoma cells, uh, transformed liver cells, if we incubate them with sporozoites that are fluorescently labeled, we can see that this population of cells in the flow cytometer are these uh, sporozoites that are now inside liver cells, that's what it's measuring. If we use dead sporozoites, we don't see that. 
And then if we incubate these with uh, antibodies that are made against this CSP protein, you can see there's a dramatic reduction in that number of cells. So this is an inhibition assay that's inhibiting the invasion of the sporozoids. And so when we apply this assay uh, to the serum from these volunteers who have been uh, immunized, we can see, as indicated on the right side of each of these panels, these are each oops, uh, individuals. Uh, when you look, you can see that there's a downward curve over time with each dose of parasites, indicating that there's inhibition of this invasion, indicating that there are antibodies that are present that prevent invasion of these uh, liver cells. Now, frankly, you don't know whether this is indicative of the real mechanism of protection. We don't know if it's a surrogate assay or not. So we're trying to develop a more robust and appropriate assay. So what we've done is we're using uh, mice, I mean mice, which are immunocompromised mice, and uh, transplanting into them human primary hepatocytes, or human liver cells. And then what we see is that, uh, moving from uh, left to right, that when we infect these with sporozoites, you can see that the development of these uh, parasites, and that we're just seeing nuclei here. So there's probably something like 50,000 parasites in this starting with a single parasite. So this is what's going on in the liver. And then what happens is that these, it's not real obvious here, but indicated by the arrows, after they reach a certain level of infection, the pieces of the liver cell blub off, and then they release parasites, and if we infect, inject human red blood cells into those mice, into the current human mice, those red blood cells get infected. So we're able to do the, mimic that red blood cells. That, uh, pre-erythrocytic to the erythrocytic stage uh, within the mouse. So we can start to ask questions if we start engrafting, uh, bring immune cells in to see if they will block that. So this is what we're developing. And we can do this with live mice because we can fluorescently label the parasites and we can use this uh, imaging system to be, uh, to be able to see the parasites because of the presence of the fluorescence. So this is the same mouse at different times after infection with the parasites. You can see that they're in these uh, liver cells in there and proliferate. <clears throat> so we can monitor whether or not uh, over time we really have a, uh, a response. So we're almost done. So how do we go forward to analyze uh, these vaccines? So we're using a system biology approach, which is superficially diagrammed here. So we use information about the genome of the host and the parasite, the genes that get turned on, which is called transcriptomics, other omics, what's happening with lipids and, like, and uh, sugars, et cetera, et cetera. And then we uh, integrate that data and then put it in the form of a network to try to understand the uh, interactions that go on. Then we turn that crank and uh, think, okay, we know what's going on, let's make a variation in the experiment, turn the crank, and out comes a solution. We're, wouldn't be that easy. The reality is what we do is diagram here is pretty complicated, but what we'll do is we'll take uh, serum and cells from people who have been immunized uh, and some who have not been immunized, and we look at all of the immune responses of the cells of the antibodies and the uh, white blood cell genes that get turned on, the transcriptome of these cells. And we look at what happens when they get immunized versus non-immunized, so we're seeing how they respond to the presence of the vaccine. Then we can look at when they get infected, how they respond to that. And then we compare that to whether or not they've been immunized or not, and whether they be, are protected after the immunization. And then we integrate that information, and we get these networks of functional, what you consider functional interactions and processes that are going on. And then what we do is we say, okay, we now have a signal or a signature that's indicative of immune protection versus not protection. Then we'll vary the experiment and see if that signal gets more robust or less robust as we try to improve the vaccine. So that's an early, a sort of superficial way of talking about the system. So uh, we are getting antibody responses that, uh, in response, and I won't go through this in detail, I've gone through it, and we're getting cellular responses which are indicative that we're probably getting immune responses, some indication of protection, but uh, still in the So overall conclusions. 
There's definitely drugs that are needed and that can be developed for trypanosomes. And including in that are not only African trypanosomes, but trypanosome cruzi that causes Chagas disease and Leishmania. And progress is being made. And progress, frankly, uh, I would say it is accelerated. It can be a malaria vaccine, proof of principle has been demonstrated. But there's a concerted and coordinated effort that's needed to really bring this to fruition. Uh, the efforts that's going on in the field, I would say are concerted but not coordinated and not sufficiently concerted, let's put it that way. Uh, this is an incredible time for research. It's a little bit unfortunate uh, that something thing like sequesters happen because our capabilities are ever increasing. And it's uh, both the technology and the knowledge are advancing uh, at a rapid pace. So I would say the future of infectious disease research is actually very bright. Uh, when I started my career, when I was coming out of my postdoc, it was considered bleak. And actually, uh, it was a big upswing. I figured that will happen again. Uh, and so our, our ability to move forward is only limited by uh, human and financial. And I think we cannot forget there's millions of people, literally it's probably um, 10 million people who are dying from infectious diseases out there, especially when it's about 30 years. And you know, they need um, the solutions to these diseases, and it's people like us who are in a place to deliver those solutions. So let me just uh, flash up the uh, names of the people, uh, run through them because I've already talked a bit, uh, who have been uh, helpful in these uh, projects. There's many others. I guess the bottom line is the Seattle Biomed scientists and staff, I should have also said collaborators, I've indicated some of the collaborations that we have, funding from NIH and the Gates Foundation um, primarily. And I just thank you for your attention and that's what Seattle looks like. <laughs>